coming up on Theater Talk. When you start out performing, you were you you were doing drag, right? Did you consider yourself growing up? Did you like dressing up as women, or for you was it just shtick? Was it just this is going to be you my know, way into show business? I had a both. Both, but once I started doing it for a living, it takes, once you get paid for something, it takes all the fun out of it. <laughs> Haven't we, in this rustic idol, achieved a degree of perfection? Our own Garden of Eden. Why invite in the snake? Sweet friend, I believe our hosts are saying that anonymity is no longer an option. Not if they're combing for our mailing lists and leaking for our magazine. It's that damn J. Edgar Hoover. Something about that man has never sat right with me. <laughs> From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And we are delighted to have one of our favorite guests of all time. Joan Rivers is here with us tonight on Theater Talk. That's, you know, one more pull. <laughs> one more pull. <laughs> and I could be. And you could and be. And I could be. <laughs> our old friend Harvey Firestein is here. We love to have Harvey. He's been on, you've been on four or five times now? At least. At least. You know, Somebody my, has to keep you in line. I know. I know. But one of, one of the things that you said that will always stick in my mind, because we've done... 21 years worth of shows, but I thought it was real insight into acting when you were doing uh, Tevya in Fiddler on the Roof. Oh my God, he's giving me a compliment. I'm so scared. Watch out, watch out. I'm scared. Hold my hand. Watch out. No, you, no, you said when you were playing Tevya on Fiddler on the Roof, brilliantly, you, you said something that Laurence Olivier said, find the shoes and you found the man. That's a, that was a fascinating insight into, into acting. Yeah. And this certainly ties in to no, Harvey's... No, 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 no. It certainly does. It certainly does. Casa Valentina certainly ties into the shoes. And, and that's actually how we started with the men of Casa Valentina. Well, let us first say, uh, yeah. you're here because you've got a new play. Yes. Casa Valentina, yes. opening on Broadway. On the 23rd of April at the Samuel J. Friedman Theater. Right. All right, so... Seventh Street. So you find the shoes, you found the man. How did you find the shoes for Casa Valentina? By looking for the girl. <laughs> I look at the girl. Um, what we did for the first two days, Joe Mantello had this idea, Joe, the brilliant director, had this idea of taking the company and just having the whole weekend to just let them get relaxed. Um, and we had a double table of wigs, starting with platinum blonde at one end and black at the other with every shade in between, just hundreds of wigs. Then we had racks of clothing, Everything, bras, girdles, uh, house dresses, real dresses, shoes, and then we had makeup tables with every kind of makeup. And the guys came in because it's all guys. You must say play. This, is a, this is a play about men who dress as women. Right, heterosexual transvestites. Right, right. It's a group of heterosexual transvestites back in 1962 right. who one of them and his wife founded a resort in the Catskill Mountains where these gentlemen could go and be themselves, which meant being ladies. Right. And they formed this Garden of Eden, this perfect place where no one would make fun of them, no one would point and stare. They could be themselves all day. They could sleep in undies if they wanted to, get up in the morning, shave in nightgowns, um, spend the day as women. and this perfect Garden of Eden. And sometimes they came up with their wives, sometimes they brought their children, mostly their wives, and, al and mostly alone. But for that, but, but it, for that, but, but Joe it, had a, uh, so just take us back. Oh, to so that. Joe had all this stuff, and then the guys sort of were sitting around drinking coffee, you know, like looking over there every now and then, because our cast is a little heterosexual. <laughs> <laughs> they can act too. <laughs> I know several heterosexual, heterosexual actors. actors. <laughs> yeah, not a lot, but I know. Okay. We found all of them. <laughs> put them in a costume. John Valentine. Cullum. John, John Cullum. You have not lived until you've seen John Cullum in his lavender it's dress. That's true. Is he adorable? <laughs> yes, is he, he is. All right, so all the guys are sitting there. They're all sitting there, and they're all sort of drinking coffee and, you know, like, how have you been? Oh, I haven't seen you since we, <laughs> since we broke down the doors and... <laughs> Um, you know, just as butchers can be. And, and so then I started messing around with the wigs and tossing the wigs to them, saying, try this color, try. And then it became like boys playing. Because yeah. boys will always play and actors will always play. So then it was sort of playing and, and they spent two whole days. Because here's the thing about these gentlemen, these ladies. They actually 
were more comfortable in their female attire than in their male attire. They're heterosexual men. Many of them had high pressure jobs. Most of them were white collar workers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But they always felt pressure to be men. Right. But when they put on their drag and they took on their female persona, they relaxed and they breathed. Which and that's what we need the actors to do. And that's what was happening with the actors. You have to. We ha so they rehearsed. Nobody told them what to do, but they rehearsed every day in different varieties. Some people full drag, full makeup every day. Some just with the wig on and a house dress over their men's clothes. Whatever made them comfortable. Because the idea was, by the time they got to the theater, nobody would be like awkward. Nobody would be putting anything on. They'd all be relaxed, and they are. They so it's John Cullen, Larry, Larry, Pine. Larry Pine, Tom McGowan. Uh, Nick Westray, the fabulous uh, Gabriel Ebert. Who won the Tony who for won Matilda. Who Tony last year for Matilda. Right. Um, uh, Patrick Page, of course. And Reed Burney in a career-defining performance. And they're all straight. These are, I mean, why? Well, I, I, we yeah. uh, but these are all straight actors. Did, did, did Was there any reluctance on their part? Any un, was no, anyone uncomfortable we, at all funny. about doing they, the dressing? They said it was hard. They said getting people to audition sometimes was hard. So, certain names they went after. But everyone we cast almost begged us for the role. Oh, they're having a great time. And Joe and I sort of said, let's use the ones who are really begging for the roles. We, let's not have anybody get scared later on. And there are two women in the play as well, Mayor Winningham and Lisa Emery right, right. are both. Very important. Do you have a sense that some of these straight butch actors are enjoying this so much that they might become transvestites in their personal Well, lives? you know, between you and me, uh, I, I had to take Paige Davis on the side the other day and apologize. <laughs> I said, Paige, you know, Patrick, Patrick may, you know, Patrick may not ever get back into men's clothes. But you know, she said, she said, here's the strange part: since he's been doing the role, he no longer yells at her about how long it takes her to get dressed. <laughs> so is that kind of interesting? It's like he now understands yeah, that this right. is a process that is not the easiest thing to do. What got you thinking about this play? I mean, what, what was the inspiration for this? Colin Callender, who had produced, um, um, at, when he was at HBO, in charge of HBO Films, he, he um, did uh, Tidy Endings. Right, by, from uh, Play from Safe, my play Sex, Safe yeah. Sex. For Stockard Channing and I. And he called me up and said, there's this book of photographs. These two guys uh, found a bunch of photographs at a flea market. They turned out to be photographs of these ladies up in the Catskills, and they printed a book of photographs. We'd love to get you to write a play. And I said, you know what? I actually know about it. Because my father was brought up in the Catskills in Ellenville, New York, and we knew about it. You'd heard about this I'd strange about it camp where men dressed as women. Yeah, but you know, as kids, there was a nudist colony right across the road. We'd much <laughs> rather go to the nudist colony. <laughs> you know, if we were going to walk down that road, we weren't looking for men flouncing around in dresses. We wanted to see naked people. <laughs> Children, you know. <laughs> so so I said, I knew about it. I said, but, you know, what have I got to say about, you know? And their idea was, you know, oh, it'll be a fun romp. You'll write a fun romp. You know, these, <laughs> yes. these fun people that go up there and they put on dresses and, oh, won't it be fun? It'll be like, you know, just a romp. It'll be like that, a casual fall. Or, 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 yeah, what was that terrible flight by the stewardesses? The Boeing, Boeing. Boeing, yes, Boeing. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what they had in mind. So a farce, a farce. Yeah. They chased me for years. And they said, you're the only one who actually talked about those photographs in the book. Because what, what struck me in the photographs is, look how happy they are. Look at how peace at, at peace they are. And I said, it's sort of fascinating. I'm not interested in writing it. But it is sort of fascinating the way they look. And they said, please look into it. And I started looking into it. And what I found, I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it's a whole sort of political movement happening that we think of the sexual revolution 65 to 69. This is 62. It was starting, to, everything was roiling then. 62, the Supreme Court came down with their first pro gay ruling, which was if heterosexuals have the right to ogle Marilyn Monroe's titties, mm -hmm. then homosexuals have the right to ogle men in bathing suits. You know, those muscle magazines? Yeah, 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 That's, yeah. That came down in 62. And I said, we have the lesbian, gay, bisexual, two, two spirit, trigender thing. We got this, this I know, alphabet L list. LBGT LB yeah. keeps adding more letters to it. But not transvestite. Yeah. So what happened? I found out the story, which is that the transvestite community, the heterosexual transvestite community, made a decision that society would never accept them 
if they thought they were homosexuals, that the reason their marriages broke down was not that they liked dressing as women, but that the wives feared that they went up to the country and were having sex with each other. And they made a decision, we will ban homosexuals or we are homosexuals. Yes, that's, that's the very interesting the play. thing. Right. I, I have this, the character in the play says, says and, and actually, they turn, so it turns into this big discussion between them, you know, like who are we to ban other people and all that. You know, it's a really kind of gorgeous, and I used as many quotes from the from the real, real conversations from that real conversations that I could find. But there's a line that I wrote where Reed Bernie says, "50 years from now, when homosexuals are still the back alley vermin of society, cross dressing will be as normal as cigarette smoking, <laughs> and the transvestites will." cheer those in this room. You bring out this homophobia within right. them, and but you do sort of wonder how many of the men are really afraid of their own homosexuality. And that's the question. What I really found is that none of these men dressed for the same reason. Mm -hmm. Some, it really was a sort of clothing fetish. Mm -hmm. Some, it was an underwear fetish. Mm -hmm. Some really found release in being a girl. Mm -hmm. Some found release in being a girl and wanted to have sex as a girl. Mm -hmm. Some, it was autoerotica. So, so in this little tiny group that you say they have this in common, they had nothing in common. No. Right. And it started making me think, none of us really have. If we start asking ourselves what really turns us on, what we're all so very different, and which is why we have to accept one another. There's so much to think about in this play. I've been, I saw it last Tuesday. I've been thinking about it ever since. Yeah. But Number one, how oppressed that wife was. I'm sorry, from my perspective, I felt that that wife was a doormat. Well, in 1962, women were, were yes. they not? Yes, and then the, the picture of women that they were dressing to is so, is so sort of horrifying in its own way. I mean, you know, that what's, what's being a woman to their minds dressing like a woman, the most constrained, well, ridiculous clothes. And they're all dressed like Phyllis no. Lafley. They're not dressed like... They're a, not dressed... Like casual folks. No, 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 no. no, no. Very, 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 very... respectable. They, they wanted to look like they were at a bridge. D-A-R wear. That's how, they, that's how they rated each other. You had to look real. When you started out performing, you were, you, you were doing drag, right? Did you consider yourself growing up? Did you like dressing up as women? Or for you, was it just shtick? Was it just, this is going to be you my know, way into show business? I had both, both. But once I started doing it for a living, it takes, once you get paid for something, it takes all the fun out of it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, and it does take so much work. It does. Do I love doing drag on stage? Yeah, absolutely. But, but when you were a kid, did you, did yeah, you dress I mean, as? My friend Philomena, show, uh, uh, I have two friends since kindergarten. And my friend Philomena uh, uh, brought a picture to show of like, I think we were in third grade and we did the Halloween party at my house and I was a monster. We were all monsters, you know, kids are crazy about Lon yeah, Chaney and that yeah, stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I was a lady monster. <laughs> what, was your, what was your costume as a lady? Uh, one of my mother's house dresses and then I had lipstick going down my face as if it was blood. Oh, that's and... wonderful. Was, but as a kid though, so you would just dress up like, like regular kids would dress up? Yeah, no, it wasn't very much. Not, not I mean, it was. I mean, I was. A, I was a strange kid. I was. I mean, no. You know, well, I had, and my parents allowed it. You know, I, as a little boy, had a baby doll and a carriage, mm. and the neighbors would say, "You're letting him have it," and he said, "It makes him happy. Leave him alone." <laughs> you know, my brother. My brother had cars and fights and baseball and all that, and I had my baby carriage. <laughs> and I was happy, and he was happy. When did you start? Uh, Dressing up and getting paid for it, though. Warhol, 1971. Andy Warhol um, had auditions for Pork, his one and only play, right? D directed by Anthony Ingrassia yeah. at La Mama. And I saw the ad in the paper, and I wa and I was a painting student, so I wanted to meet Warhol. I mean, yeah, it was Warhol. So I went to audition, and I was the only person cast out of the open call, <laughs> and did Pork. And then when they found out I was underage. I couldn't go with the show to London. They all went off to London, yeah. and I fell in with the Theater of the Ridiculous, which then became my life. Charles Ludlum and that whole... Well, no, Charles had already split off. Ronald Tavell, oh, yeah. who, who wrote all the early Warhol films, yeah. and that... You know, Was John Vaccaro, rather? John Vaccaro. Yeah. John Vaccaro directed me. In fact, the character's name, in, uh, George Vaccaro in the play. So then uh, dressing up as a woman becomes your profession. Yes, until Ellen Stewart put her foot down. Ellen Stewart... But La Mama? Uh, La Mama herself said, uh, my baby don't wear bloomers no more. Hmm. 
And I said, why? She said, Mr. Firestein, you can look at all these people and they will be here the rest of their lives and Mama's going to have to support them. But you have something very special and I don't want you hiding in bloomers. So she my jaw's dropping. That's so she put me. So I, I did a one man play of H M Katuka's poetry yes. called One Man's Religion, mm -hmm. and she came to my dressing room every night. You know, because she used to ring the do the bell, say welcome to La Mama, dedicated to the playwright and all aspects of the theater, <laughs> and she used to. That was more Yiddish than French. <laughs> she was from Chicago, so. Um, <laughs> and uh, she'd come to my dressing room before she made the announcement and take a tissue and wipe my face to make sure there was no makeup on it. Really? Mm. So she, she saw the writer in you? Yes. Not the performer, but the writer. Well, both. No, she saw the performer, too. Right. Then when I wrote the first act of Torch Song Trilogy, you know, um, International Studs, she said, are you in drag? And I said, only in one scene. She said, I'm not going to. I said, Mama, it's only one scene. I didn't tell her another scene. I was having sex in the back room bar. <laughs> <laughs> But that was, but I think that was okay with Mama. I don't think that did face her. One night in the trucks, you know what the trucks were? Yes. The trucks were these these trucks that they would park on the West Side Highway in the meat packing district. Oh, yeah. yeah. And a, uh, uh, one of the owners of this thing was, uh, his son was gay, so he'd leave the trucks open. So in the And that's region, where everybody had anonymous sex. sex so yeah. Right. And one night Ellen came down there because she needed us. And she'd back all the Mama people out of there. I need you. All the Mama <laughs> Yeah, so Ellen you know, wasn't upset about people, that. People, <laughs> were you all in the trucks and you had yeah, to of course come we out there. and go do the play? Do yeah, the we play. had to go do whatever she wanted. I forget what she needed, but we had to go do it. <laughs> right. Personal question here, but you don't dress up as a woman now like these guys do to relax anymore. No, so, no, 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 no. I never Although get that to would relax. be none of your business. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but no, there's nothing relaxing about, about it. I, well, to me, there's nothing relaxing. You know, it's, it's, it's about performing. So let's get to the good part. All so. Right. Um, when I'm doing my research and all that, I found one of these gentlemen who is now a woman. Who lives in Australia. Who lives in Australia. So Kate, Catherine, he Catherine Cummings, who has her own autobiography out there, Catherine Cummings' book, um, she became my guide in right. uh, into that world. And then, so, so that helped me, and I started understanding stuff and, and blah, 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 and then found other stuff. And, and, I, and I've met a lot of other people since then. But I but my idea was I didn't want to speak too much to current uh transvestites. I wanted to capture that that time when men were men and women were women and transvestites were transvestites. And transvestites were transvestites and this poor woman Rita yeah. was putting up with it and and what she you know what what she put up with and, and how she subjugated herself to to her husband. Her husband's narcissism. Which is, but it's, well, uh, you use the word narcissist. That's it's a great word I use in the play a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, yeah, they used to, there used to be a line that ended up getting cut just because of time. But um, a narcissist has no one to blame but himself <laughs> in the middle of that fight scene. But um, the other night, um, sitting there in the audience was one of the girls who was there every weekend <laughs> who shot, who turns out to have shot 90% of the photographs in the book. And As a girl, or was it a man? Who was, well, I mean, it's a man who came, but he came to the theater dressed as yeah, big earrings. He was with his daughter, who's very supportive of him, huh. and um, and they came to the theater, and they're going to come to opening night also. And they, and he's just wonderful, filled with fabulous stories. When I we interviewed you about this play when you just started working on it, you said that a lot of the people you contacted wouldn't talk to you. Yeah, exactly, but and this is one that I thought wouldn't talk to. Well, I don't. He says he would have, but I tried to contact him, and he. Didn't. Are there still some who are alive who, who will not yeah. discuss it? Mm -hmm. Because it's just a secret they'll never oh, tell. Oh, because they're older now. You know, yes. Catherine is. We we celebrated her 79th birthday. This other gentleman is 72. Mm -hmm. They're older. Some of them probably don't dress anymore, or if they do, I mean, the casa the casa hasn't been there. This resort hasn't been there since the 70s. Having written this play, having thought about these guys, having studied their lives, and not to be judgmental in any way, do they dress up because there's something in their lives that they can't acknowledge openly? Is it just they want a little compartment to themselves that is just their thing? Every sort of reason you can imagine, and that's what I was trying to say in the play. Yeah. Every, And what happens in the play is they have this Garden of Eden, but two of them want more. 
They want the world to accept them. They want society to accept them. They want to be able to walk out in the street. And they force the group into the public eye. They register with the government as a nonprofit, and they force. And it's that wanting more. The imagery of the play is the Garden of Eden. Yeah. And, and so Charlotte becomes the snake that comes in. But it's not the snake that ate the apple. It's Eve. And, right. and as one of the characters says, and Eve would never have taken that bite unless she wanted more. And once that apple's bitten, the, the, the place falls apart. They're not safe anymore. Right. With that knowledge, with that opening up to the world, they're no longer safe. The place sort of falls apart. It's not a safe place to stay anymore. And one of the characters has to admit, well, I don't want to ruin the place. No, and, you, and there's no easy answer? There's no easy answer. No, no because you want acceptance. But on the other hand, you have created this world where they can really be themselves on their own terms. But what is it they really yes, want? Yes, that's the point. Yeah. That's the point. And that's what the, he asks. The, 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 and what I ask one of the, the wife who's been who has facilitated all of this. The doormat, yes. She owns a wig shop. She does wigs for all of them. She cooks for them. She cleans for them. She dresses very plainly while they all dress up. She pours their drinks. She cle and, and, and thinks she's helping these wonderful, lovely people, these, these people that treat her like gold. They treat her wonderfully until she begins to realize they're not fooling around. They're not just dressing up here. There's something more going on. And she asks her husband, are you George or are you Valentina? At the end of the play, he goes up to get dressed. She forces him to get dressed. He doesn't even want to. And she says, is today the day you go up those stairs and I never see George again? The funny part is nobody really knows what happened to them. Mm -mm. Mm. Two of them, oh, the two life? leads, yeah, Charlotte, the, the one who the starts wife. the organization. No, Charlotte's the organization. She just died like five years ago in her late 80s or early 90s. And she lived as a woman for all, most of her life after her second marriage fell apart. She who put down people who lived as women. She hated Christine Jorgensen and all that. She ended up living as a woman the rest of her life. And Valentina, the best I can find out is the wife died. The wife was actually 10 years older than he. Uh, the wife died, and Jackie, Jacqueline, just told this, this gentleman that I just met, Jacqueline, told me that he heard he moved back to Cuba. So I, nobody knows what happened to them. Fascinating. You've got to see it for oh, yourself. It's, it's a, I, you know, I'm so proud of this play because it's so funny. Yes. It's so funny. But it's like starts out like really human, and then it becomes this sort of wild comedy, and then all of a sudden it's politics, and then by the second act you realize that politics really are us trying to, exp to, to put our imprint on the world. And, and then, then it comes, and then it comes back around. Because I assumed that the audience was going to walk in with real prejudice. Like, these guys are all gay, and they're up here fooling around, and what are these idiots? And hopefully we take you in so you fall in love with them. And then it, just before the curtain, I send somebody out there to express who you were when you first walked in, and who, who says everything you would That's think right. when you first walked in. And it's shocking to and hear that again. And she has a big point. And she has a big point. But it's shocking to hear yes, what she shocking. says it, because you like these people. Uh, Casa Valentina at the Samuel Friedman Theater. It is only one of uh, several Harvey Firestein shows on Broadway now. I believe there are a couple of other little things you got Something cooking. Something called Newsies. Yeah, and we uh, just celebrated two years. We're now into our third year and about to send out the tour. Something called Kinky Boots. Oh yeah, that Tony. That one. Yeah, that Tony, Tony award-winning show. <laughs> it's just celebrated one year, and we're just about to send out that tour, and it's going into rehearsal in Korea. So I got. Three on Broadway. <laughs> All right. So Broadway. it's a nice thing. I, I go Forty First Street, Forty Fifth Street, Forty Sixth. I call. I, think I need something on Forty Four. <laughs> I debut the mayor of Broadway. And it's <laughs> come to pass. It must be great. Every every time you go to the mailbox, there must be a nice check there from this show or that show or this. That's show. nice, but you know that's not the nicest part. You know the thing that you call me the mayor of Broadway is because he walked down the street with me and all these people. You cannot you know, walk. Two steps with this man in Times Square have, without people coming up to him and you know talking to him. Do you know what that feels like, though? Do you know how wonderful that feels when people come? And they, I mean, I was with somebody and they were just absolutely shocked that 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 people talk to me as if they've known me all exactly, their lives. And, exactly. And then you know how wonderful that is that people come up and they, oh, Harvey, when I saw this, blah, 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 and they tell me, they tell me, oh, and you got to eat over here. I had the, had the chicken there. It was very good. <laughs> and I mean, it's, it's,
<laughs> you know, to think of being a kid dreaming that one day you'd be on Broadway is something. Right. But to be such a part of Broadway is beyond any dream I ever had. But you know, and I do not take it for granted. All right, Casa Valentina at the Samuel J. Friedman Theater. Harvey, one of our favorite. Wear your heels. Okay. <laughs> Find the heels, you found the man. <laughs> it's true. I don't know how to ask this. Reading the magazine, everyone says that they feel half male and half female. They make it sound so organized. Organized, that's funny. It's intimidating. It's advertising. Do you eat a bowl of weenies and expect to win the World Series? <laughs> but... How do you balance the female part? I'm a decorated war hero wearing a house coat and turban. Do you really want my advice? <laughs> Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, plus public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency, and the Theater Development Fund's Technical Accessibility Program, which helps provide closed captioning. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you and good night.